Good afternoon, everyone. Today, the Adams Seminar has the great pleasure to welcome once more Professor Richard Elliott. He's currently a professor emeritus at the Chemical, Biomolecular, and Corrosion Engineering Program at the University of Akron. And his research interest is mainly focused on molecular simulation, thermodynamics, polymer physics, and phase equilibria. Besides, he's the co-author of the thermodynamics section of Paris Chemical Engineering Handbook and also the upcoming sixth edition of Property of Gases and Liquids. I think he needs no further introduction by this point. He has been a great friend to the Adams Group and has been with us since the beginning of this seminar series. So once again, welcome back, Professor Elliot. Thank you so much for being here with us and please feel free to start your presentation. Oops. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. So while while preparing for this presentation, I thought I should go back and check if I was going to be repeating myself. You know, when you get to be my age, you you, you need to worry about things like that. So it turns out that yes, I had talked about activity models before. But this was the very first lecture uh, two years ago or so. And, and what I was trying to achieve with that introduction was really more of an undergraduate presentation. I, I wasn't sure at that time what, what the seminar was or what we were uh, working on. And, and so uh, it was a very basic introduction. What are activity coefficients good for and how do you use them? Well, from there, we went into some more still practical things, but maybe not so much at the undergraduate level. And then we really went down the rabbit hole. And then in the last presentation, I talked about, we came up for air, let's say, and, and what are the impacts of all of these different theoretical considerations on practical things that chemical engineers need to know about on a day-to-day -day basis. When, when all is said and done, we need to compare to experimental data that's important for the chemical engineering processes. So that was the last one. And, and now we're coming all the way back to talk about activity models again, but it's gonna be different. We're gonna be calling on many of these conceptual frameworks that I talked about in the past. And we're gonna be talking trying to understand why there are so many models and are they different or not? And if they are different, why are they different? In what ways? And the reason I think there's a better understanding needed is that some things are represented as being the same when they're actually quite different. Some things are represented as being completely different when they're actually quite the same. <laughs> And, and, and so I find all of that very confusing. And, and if I do, maybe, maybe you do too. And, and so here's the outline is, first, let's get out of the way that, that there are a lot of things that actually are very similar. They're just uh, different ways of saying the same thing. And, and so all of your quadratic equations of state, they're all essentially the same thing. Then I'd like to bring up a, a, a point related to what Professor Dill talked about last week about how Wertheim's theory, I'm gonna to referring to that as a TPT1. So if I don't have it in a subscript, that means it's a form of Wertheim's theory. And so I could talk about TPTN where you could have a second order Wertheim's theory, right? Or a third or a fourth. Uh, if I put a subscript on it, that's referring to the high temperature expansion. Okay, so that's the only way I know of to, to really distinguish between those two. Um, one of the, so and this master equation method is that one of the objections that Professor Dill had to Wertheim's approach was that you end up with too many equations to solve. He wants to solve zero equations. He wants an analytical solution so he can move very fast. And what I'm going to show you is that if you solve one equation, you get everything. And uh, maybe that's not asking too much. Um, so. Then we will talk about quasi-chemical theory and how that actually relates to Cosmo RS. So this is a case where something that you might've thought was different is actually the same. 
And something that seems very unfamiliar to you is actually more familiar than you might think. And, and so uh, then what we're going to find out is that TPT1 and quasi-chemical theory are very similar in the way that they treat hydrogen bonds. On the other hand, quasi-chemical theory and universal quasi-chemical theory, also known as uniquack, are very different. And, and so you might have thought they were the same. I know I did for a while. And, and so uh, where does that lead us? Well, uniquax is a local composition theory. Should we go back to the orzine zernike equation? Radial distribution functions is, is what the orzine zernike equation is all about. And those are basically just very high resolution local composition functions. Finally, we'll get to a point where uh, I just don't know. <laughs> there are things that I don't know. And, and so how can we learn to live with that? So let's, uh, let's begin by recognizing that we can apply the expansion rule. And you have to be a little careful about this. And, and Carl Lira wrote a paper uh, that helps with this in a big way. You can decompose the activity coefficient into its parts that are one part due to the repulsive part, right? Uh, and that's an athermal contribution. So the, in the ESD equation or the Ping Robinson or the Suave Red Lequam Van der Waals equation, all of those repulsive terms are athermal. And so we can separate out that repulsive athermal part from the dispersed attractions and from the chemical attractions, the hydrogen bonding attractions, okay? And when we do that, this is the plot that we get. You can see the different parts. And we see that there is a, an influence on, of the repulsive part at constant pressure. And so it's a little bit complicated. If we change our reference frame from constant pressure, which technically is the definition of the activity coefficient, but because of the expansion rule, we can, we can change that reference frame. And, and change it to a constant packing fraction basis, then things get quite a bit simpler because the repulsive contribution then for all of those Van der Waals repulsive types of equations um, goes to zero. And instead of having six lines to worry about, we just got four. Then we can focus and, and just talk about what's going on with the dispersed attractions and what's going on with the chemical contributions. There's a full disclosure I should make here. When you do that, you're, if, you, if you run at constant pressure, your packing fraction changes. If you run at constant packing fraction, your pressure changes. And it doesn't just change a little bit. Uh, it starts at about one bar and it goes up to 600 bars. And, and so, uh, yeah, but once you, you when you met bottle and isothermal, system, you're, you're assuming that the activity coefficient doesn't change with pressure. And, and from there, it's a slippery slope, let's just say. Uh, so the result of all of these theories, then it could be ESD, ping Ramesson, anything that's got a quadratic mixing rule, is you end up with your activity coefficient for the attractive part looking like this. And you can rearrange that into this scattered Hildebrand form. So, and, and if you attach the Flory Huggins uh, repulsive contribution for, for mixing, uh, which actually comes from the ideal gas reference state, and so it's got really nothing to do with liquids, um, then what you see is that all of these Flory Huggins type models uh, are represented in all these different equations of state are represented in the Flory Huggins model. Well, what about that a thermal reference system? <clears throat> Are there deviations from Flory Huggins? And Guggenheim Staverman came up with a way of, of characterizing that amount. And they were working at the time with lattice theories and doing the best that they could. But it's been over 60 years since 19, yeah, almost 70 years since 1950. Well, actually, Staverman did his thing in 1950, so it's been 72 years. So it's 
there's some time that's gone by. And, and so uh, is it really necessary to assume lattices anymore? Why don't we just do the molecular simulations of a thermal system that are branched and have rings and long polymers and short chains and spheres mixed together? Do all of the everything, simulate them and calculate the entropy. It's a pretty straightforward thing to do. You get the pressure from your simulation, you integrate the pressure, and because this athermal system has zero energy between the molecules, you get the entropy. And again, we, we've talked about this before, so I won't dell on it, but this guggenheim staverman thing is off by an order of magnitude for a mixture of ethane and hexadecane at a packing fraction of 0.5. So I'm just going to mention that when it comes to activity modeling and what we know now relative to what we knew then, um, it may be time to move on from guggenheim staverman And I, I think you need to understand that. So let's talk about the master equation method. And what do I mean by that? Well, this should look familiar if you're familiar with uh, TPP1, SAF, that sort of thing. You end up with a set of equations to solve for the mole fraction of acceptors not bonded, okay? One minus that quantity, so in other words, the fraction that is bonded, must be proportional to sort of a chemical reaction of all the possible ways that that acceptor could be bonded to some donor somewhere in the solution. And, and then you've got to do the same thing for all the donors. And so if you've got five compounds, 10 compounds, uh, who knows what you've got in a soup full of proteins, then uh, you've got a, all of those to worry about. You've got all the acceptors and all the donors that you've got to solve for. That could be a large system of equations. I could see how somebody would think that that's too slow. On the other hand, look at this equation. There's no I anywhere inside these summations except here. What if we could approximate that rho delta quantity by something that's factorizable, pull that factor out, move it to the left-hand side, then the summation just becomes over J. In other words, when you've summed something that goes over J, you're done with something that doesn't have a subscript. And, and so let's give that quantity a name. I'll just call it F. And I'm going to say within the context of this assumption that I'm making here, uh, they, all the acceptors and donors are equal. Just assume a similar, the equal number of acceptors and donors for this first version. Then uh, we can write the master equation in this way, completely get rid of the x's, solve for f. It's one equation and one unknown. And then we can go back and plug that definition to calculate all the x's for everything. So that's not too bad because this equation is actually very easy to solve. In fact, it's so easy to solve, a lot of times you don't even need to solve it. Um, so let's take a look at what happens for a mixture of benzene and methanol. The benzene's not associating, so its alpha is zero. We don't need to worry about that. Term. The only term we need to worry about is the methanol. And this is a quadratic equation, so we can solve this instantly. That's an exact equation. There's no iteration there. And, and so nobody can complain about that. What happens when alpha is zero? Then that's very easy to solve. It's zero divided by one, zero. What happens when alpha is 900? which is a typical value for methanol. Well, you've got 900 here compared to one. Let's call it 900. Then you've got the square root, you've got 300 compared to one. Let's call it 300. Okay, you've got the square root of 900 here, that's 300. Well, you've got 300 over 300 here. Um, so that, that part is pretty much canceling. Um, what I'm left with is something that's roughly the square root of this degree of polymerization. And for methanol, that number is just one. <laughs> so uh, this is actually a pretty easy thing to solve. Um, and, and what I end up with, I think this two belongs here. Uh, what I end up with is that for methanol, this quantity F is just going to be one. Any kind of pure associating compound, F is going to be one. And if you've got a lot of water present with a few other things, F is going to be one. So uh, 
if we're thinking about infinite dilution activity coefficients, because what, what we're trying to get across here, what is the influence of the chemical contribution on the activity coefficient? That's what the lecture is all about. Then we can get a pretty good idea of that just by looking at the infinite dilution activity coefficients. And so let's take the general equation for the chemical contribution to the activity coefficient, and let's substitute in the various limits. Well, if methanol is at infinite dilution, then it's pure benzene and F is zero. If benzene is at infinite dilution, it's pure methanol and F is one. And conversely, if the methanol is pure, then F is one, if the benzene is pure. It's got so many subscripts and so many things going on here. I, I just have, personally, I have to be very careful when I make the substitutions to make sure that everything works out. And, and so bear with me. So let's plug this in. And uh, what we see is that, well, for benzene, alpha is zero. It has no hydrogen bonding with itself. And so this is just one over one, log of one is zero. It doesn't matter what that is. And all we're left with is these two quantities. Well, if the benzene is at infinite dilution, that means it's pure F and F and pure methanol and F is one. If the benzene is pure, F is zero. All we're left with here is the volume ratio of benzene and methanol. And that's the chemical contribution to benzene. That's very simple. That's not hard to understand. And if we do the same thing for the methanol, then what we find is when the methanol is pure, we have to keep this term and we got that you know, square root of 900 here. But when the methanol is in a solution, this is zero, that goes away. The degree of polymerization for methanol is just one. Methanol infinite solution, that's zero, that term goes away. All I'm left with then is this contribution. Well, that's not too hard to understand. It's not as easy as this, but it's not too bad. So the long story, long story short here is, um, if you're really in a hurry, like Professor Dill seems to be, don't solve it. Just put F equals one or F equals zero, depending on the situation, and plug in all your uh, one over X's and out square roots of alphas, and you've got all the X's that you need. You don't need to solve. That's got to be fast. Um, now let's talk about quasi-chemical theory. And the thing that people even I didn't realize for a long time was that the Cosmo part and the RS part are really two separate parts. Most of the papers that you read, they present them as a single thing. But, and there's, there's some reason why they do that, and I'll touch on that in a second. But bottom line is, this quasi-chemical the thermodynamics in this RS slash SAC model is actually goes back to, well, it goes back to 1944 when Guggenheim first articulated the quasi-chemical theory, but Guggenheim got stuck when it came to extending the theory to multi-component polysegmented species. That was done in 1980 by Paniatu and Vera. And this is the equation, and it may look familiar to you. This, is, this first equation is the same equation that was developed for UNIFAC and the ASOG model. In 1962, it was just a conjecture. It was just a wild guess, really. <laughs> Seemed to make sense, and, and that's what they ran with. Well, in 1980, Paniatu and Vera proved that, yes, that is actually the correct form. You can sum up the group activity coefficients and compute the overall molecular activity coefficient in this manner. Now, the second equation may be less familiar. That's the equation that actually requires quasi-chemical theory. And what you can see is you've got some quantities on the left-hand side that are repeated on the right-hand side, and it requires successive, some sort of iteration method in order to solve this. Well, long story short, the people who developed UNIQAC did not want to do that kind of iteration. And so they developed an approximate analytical solution. 
And, and so that's what we call uniquet, is essentially dropping this equation and applying their approximate equation. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that approximation is later. But right now, let's talk about Cosmo. If you look in the more slightly evolved papers of, of uh, Klomp and Lennon Sandler, Klomp developed Cosmo in 1995, but there were a couple of iterations. And, and so in 2002, everything settled down. And these two papers are essentially equivalent. And you see that this equation and that equation are the same equation. And this equation and this equation are the same equation. There are some slight differences in notation. So for instance, the Paniatu and Vera equation is talking about activity coefficients at a, a segment level, a, a complete, where the segment is a, the size of a CH3 functional group, okay? And the Cosmo is representing patches of contact energy, and they use this symbol gamma. But if you recognize that the gamma JJ is just equal to the gamma J squared, then the log of something squared is two, the two cancels the half, and you see that these equations are the same. And Paniatu did a, a, a nice analysis of this in 2003, if, if you want some more details on that. So an important component of this Cosmo RS approach is that it requires this small segment size. And that, that's really important for people like me who care about hydrogen bonding. So Paniatu and Vera in 1982 proposed a standard segment size that they've gone on and, and been very consistent on throughout their uh, further publications. Now, Paniatu has done some things with hydrogen bonding um, where he uh, calls it the lattice fluid hydrogen bonding, but he adds that on as a separate term, okay? So whenever he's talking about segments, he's talking about segments that are about 9.75 centimeters cubed per mole. If you assume that's a sphere, you get a sigma that's this size, solve for the uh, surface area, and, and you get uh, 31 nanometers squared, okay? So what did Barker do in 1952? He recognized that to get hydrogen bonding, you needed orientational specificity. And so you needed to make sure that only one face of your cubic unit cell in this lattice theory had a contact energy equivalent to hydrogen bond. So he divided that surface area by 10. And uh, Klomp, in his first iteration, used something very, very similar, actually. But later on, he re-optimized the, the theory, and he came up with a, a, a value closer to 0 0.07. Lynn and Sandler's version came up with uh, 0 0.075, very similar. In a more recent work, uh, Ferrarini et al. and with Rafael Suarez came up with a value of 0 0.042. And, and so it's kind of going back to the future, getting smaller again. I actually like the smaller values better uh, because they're a little bit closer to what TPP1 assumes actually. Um, these graphs, I, these, these figures, I think, help you to understand what it, means to break down the surface of a molecule into segments. And so these segments are using the Suarez uh, value. And, and so you can see that some segments are gonna have a contact energy or the cap cap capacity for a contact energy. If this red comes in contact with the blue, then you're gonna have the contact energy that's hydrogen bonding, okay? So, so you can compute all of those contact energies, put them into your QCT formulas, and you can get the, the result. Uh, something that's interesting, the way that Cosmo RS SAC works then, and this is why things are presented in an integrated fashion many, many times, is they're kind of inseparable. The, the way that Cosmo RS SAC calculates these contact energies is from a kind of a periodic table where the elements are these bins of surface polarization density. So this is something like charge per angstrom squared. And this is the quantity that you need quantum DFT to calculate. Then once you've got those values, you come up with some kind of 
formula that relates those polarization energies to contact energies. And, and that's where you need some sort of semi-empirical correlation and, and various ones are available. Uh, but it makes sense that qualitatively, there should be some connection between these surface polarizations and the contact energy that you need to put into your quasi-chemical theory. So the key here difference in, from a quasi-chemical perspective is that Cosmo RSAC needs a small segment size. And uh, that's the thing that I'm going to use to emphasize when I'm talking about the small segment QCT and Cosmo RS, and when I'm talking about Guggenheim's QCT and uh, the, the more segment-based, the more functional group-based approach to things. One thing I want to mention here is that this use of the word elements is actually uh, inspired by Guggenheim himself. This is the word that he used when he talked about in his very last chapter uh, about extending the theory to molecules that ha are, have different types of surface energy distributed around the molecule surface. Now, so it's interesting that he conceived of this whole idea. All of these ideas were in his mind. It's just that at the time, he could only solve by hand for uh, two elements on two molecules. But he clearly conveys the idea that, that more could be done. And, and he gives the word elements instead of segments, but the modern uh, literature has, has gone with the word segments. And so I've, I've just adopted that literature. Well, if quasi-chemical theory says some things about hydrogen bonding, and TPT1 says some things about hydrogen bonding. Are they saying the same thing or are they saying something different? Let's plug them in and see what comes out. Uh, here's the system that I imagine is a simple sphere, hard sphere with one acceptor on one type molecule of type one, one donor on molecule of type two. And uh, the bonding energy is 2000 kelvins. And otherwise, these molecules are just hard spheres floating in space. And well, not too much space. They both, they're both at liquid density. And so uh, packing fraction of 0.35. And so uh, for QCT, I'm just going to assume a coordination number of 10. In other words, one tenth. My segment size, my area, effective area is one tenth of the overall surface area. And uh, for SSQCT, that's the same thing. And for TPT1, it's an interesting thing that I did. I, I said, well, what should I assume? And I looked at methanol in the ESD model. And it turned out that if you calculate the, the, si the diameter of what corresponds to this bonding volume, and you say, OK, what fraction of that is, OK, then you do your volume to area conversion, compare that to the total surface area for the methanol molecule, you come up with a number that's very close to 10%. And so uh, it's not too hard to make this connection between TPT1 and, and QCT. And so uh, let's do that. And uh, for more details, um, I plug that in and I get a value uh, for this alpha quantity that's about 26 at uh, 333 Kelvin and point, oh, I think this is the square root of alpha. Yeah, it's 26 squared. So um, the square root of alpha keeps coming up in the equation so much that I mixed that up. I'm sorry about that. Well, let's calculate the excess internal energy. And the dot, dot, dot means there's a few steps in between. But what you end up with is this result. This y quantity, when you're at a temperature like room temperature, is, is something like 600 and one plus one, 600 and one over 600. So in the room temperature range, this quantity is pretty close to one. This, this XA and this XA, they're different, uh, but they're similar. And you see that the beta epsilon quantity is, is right there in both cases. So it's not actually all that surprising that the TPT1 and the QCT come out to be very similar. And the SSQCT, a funny thing about this, these two quantities, these equations look similar. 
spots, they're slightly different. These two equations look different. They're actually identical. They give exactly the same result. That's why there's only one dotted line over here. So there's a lot of opportunities to be confused in this literature. And, and so the, the takeaway message is that the TPT-1 and QCT are very similar when it comes to the way that they treat hydrogen bonding at a packing fraction of 0.35. Now, this raises a question. And I think there's a way to answer this question. And uh, I don't have the answer yet. Though. And I might need some help to get it. <laughs> so what we have in quasi-chemical theory is that it assumes that only the contact energy matters. In other words, the next neighbor effect does not matter. Well, that's not too different from what Wertheim's perspective was on these blister potentials that he proposed, all right? So let's, let's think about ways that we could represent potential models that fit the theory. <laughs> and then let's go do the simulation of those potential models across all temperatures, densities, compositions, and epsilons. We, we need to sample different epsilons, so we talk about why not apply TPT1 for, or TPTN, let's say. You could take a, a second order of time theory, okay, that accounts for these kinds of uh, short range, strong or not strong interactions, right? So the epsilons could be dispersion energies or uh, hydrogen bonding energies. Which theory was going to be best? As long as the potential function is limited to this short range quantity, maybe they'll do similar. On the other hand, there's a fundamental difference in the way that Bertheim conceived of his perturbation theory. In his perspective, two molecules come together and make one molecule. In Guggenheim's formulation, two molecules come together and form two molecules. Well, if you think about the impact of that on entropy, when you go from two things to one thing, that's a big change in entropy. If you go from two things to two things, eh, that's not so much. And it might not make a difference if you're talking about a liquid or a solid because there's not that much more room for these independent A's and B's to move around. But when you start changing the density, maybe it's not that simple. Um, there are adopters and, and developers of quasi-chemical theory would say, oh, well, we'll just throw in some holes. Well, then that restricts you back to a lattice with holes in it. And everything about quasi, everything about the Cosmo RS perspective, there's no reference to a lattice in there. So we've, we've superseded that lattice approximation in the SSQCT perspective. So uh, let's don't go back to that. And in fact, in a 1990 paper by uh, Vera and Wilczek Vera, they also showed that the quasi-chemical theory does not need to have anything about a lattice in it. And so let, let's don't go back to the lattice. Let's, let's say, okay, we, we like this quasi-chemical theory. Let's, it, it's supposed to take into account everything that happens for uh, close contact. Let's, let's, give it, let's put it to the test. Um, and then if uh, we need to worry about things that are beyond the first layer, like we did in speed MD. So we've talked about all these different kinds of perspectives on potential functions before. So maybe we get rid of this first uh, shell of energy and, we, and leave it up to these cubic spheres, what I call it, because if you have six contacts, then that's, that's like a simple cubic uh, lattice, right? So it, it's all lattice. We're going to put these things in space, but it's just kind of a cute name I made up. <laughs> Trying to say, you know, what you what happens when you've got a sphere with six sides. And and one thing I'll mention about this too, I, I've drawn this with with reds and blues and greens. You could have this be all greens, and you could have different shades of green. In in other words, different depths of this first layer of attractive energy. All of that is easy to represent, and then. You could just add one more layer 
of attractive energy, maybe in the square well form, maybe you add that part with HTE, high temperature expansion TPT, and that'll be a simple extra feature, okay? And, and solving for the local interactions uh, in the first shell, maybe that's gonna be the most important part. So we can test all of those hypotheses with a molecular simulation by fitting the, the potential and figure out, you know, which theory uh, represents that potential model the best. And so I think this would be a good computer experiment to perform. And if we wanted, so, so I'll mention that uh, if you look at all of the different ratios of this uh, 9.75 and the areas and the areas that people have assumed for a patch, then what you see is that ratio varies between four and seven. So six is in that range. Four is also pretty close to that range. And so Professor Dill might be uh, happier with this particular approach. Let's go back and look at quasi-chemical theory in relation to Uniquack. We said, well, there's this approximation that Uniquack is making so that they can get an analytical solution instead of having to iterate. Is that a big difference or not? In 1983, Fisher looked at this using a molecular simulation approach. And what he did was he did molecular simulations of Leonard Jones spheres and compared them to quasi-chemical theory. And he showed that the quasi-chemical theory matched the molecular simulations pretty well. So I'm, I'm sort of leaving that aside and I'm just focusing on quasi-chemical theory here and comparing different versions of quasi-chemical theory. And, and what you see is that since the quasi-chemical theory agreed with the molecular simulations, there are different ways. And if you just take a first order quasi-chemical theory, you actually do very, very well. And, and so you just do a high temperature expansion of the quasi-chemical theory, and that gives you your, your Helmholtz en or your Helmholtz energy, Gibbs energy, free energy. And, and so what you find out is that that's actually very accurate. Um, when you Use Uniquack though, and this is for a Kij value of zero here on the left hand side. That, that's probably a pretty good Kij value for argon and xenon. These are, you know, ideal molecules. And, and so what you see though is that the Uniquack equation actually has the wrong sign. You can't even compute <laughs> the deviation in percentage terms when in. in for this result, it's it's not defined, and and so you can't say that that Uniquack is a pretty good approximation at quasi chemical theory at that point. Um, it's just not, and and we said that it. Well, go back to the lecture by C.C. Uh, C. Chen last December. He showed you that you need to add a separate term for hydrogen bonding contributions whenever you're dealing with a local composition model. And so the local composition models like Uniquack are simply not accounting for hydrogen bonding as hydrogen bonding. And, and so there's no hydrogen bonding in Uniquack, but there is in QCT, we just talked about that. And QCT, uh, Uniquack is not right for the dispersion interactions either. So at least not always. So if you go ahead and you make your KIJ much larger, then you can say, yes, uh, Uniquack is at least qualitatively in the right direction. Um, but this other theory called lattice surface Guggenheim developed by Barry in 1977, what's that? What they did was they said, well, you really ought to check that and make sure that if you're calling it quasi-chemical theory, um, that it's somehow similar to quasi-chemical theory. And, and so what they did was they did a very small change to Uniquack. The, Uniquack puts the coordination number in the exponent. And you can take the same expression for the internal energy and keep the coordination number as a factor in front and then do the integration with respect to free energy. And, and so you just end up with that coordination number multiplying the, the free energy instead of being in the exponent. And when you do that, you get this lattice surface Guggenheim method. And hey, it's, it's a lot better than uh, Uniquack. So, so there are things that are easy to do uh, and, and still be a lot closer to the quasi-chemical theory. But we said, hey, 
Uniquack is a local composition theory. Local compositions are given by radial distribution functions. Ornstein's Zernike equation gives us radial distribution functions. Why don't we go and calculate what the local compositions really are using an accurate theory? And Lee Sandler and Monson did hundreds of Monte Carlo simulations for square well spheres of different sizes and uh, energies and uh, different densities. I'm just showing the result at one density. And, and then here, and, and they showed that the Ornstein Zanarchy with the MSA closure is very accurate. So let's analyze that result using the, Orange, the OZ MSA and just go and calculate what the local compositions are at one liquid packing fraction and ask, okay, what's that telling us? Um, so a horizontal line here says that the only thing that matters is the size ratio of the atoms. And, and so what you see is that's not a bad approximation if the compound is dilute. In fact, it's a very good approximation if the compound is infinitely dilute. But if the compound is relatively pure, then that compound can pick which neighbor it wants to be around it. And so with a Kij value of 0.2, it's gonna choose molecules like itself because it, it dislikes the other molecules. And so as a function of energy, as the, the strength of that like or dislike uh, grows in magnitude, you see this preference grow. And, and that makes sense um, when, you, when you see the result and you reason it out this way. But quasi-chemical theory would say that this effect of temperature ought to be about twice what it is in its strongest case, and that it should not be a composition dependent. Um, and, and so in th those ways, quasi-chemical theory is not getting it right. Uniquack is doing something completely different. Um, and there's another thing that I'd like to mention about quasi-chemical theory. And that goes back to the Einstein's energy equation that we talked about a long time ago. And well, a year ago. And what does it mean to say that nearest neighbors shouldn't have any influence? as an assumption, which is the quasi-chemical assumption. Well, if that was true, then only direct contacts would matter and only the direct correlation function would matter. And all of this part shouldn't make any difference. But we know that makes a big difference at high density. Those are the, the things that dominate the radial distribution function at high density. And, and so this gives us reason to, to question some of the assumption of quasi-chemical theory. Um, so, so, but I'm still willing to do that experiment and, and to understand better, okay, when does it work? When does it doesn't work? And some of these simulations of, of Lee Sandler and Monson, uh, can contribute to that without having to do any new simulations. I'll just mention one more thing here about Uniquack versus QCT. Uh, Suarez and Stout have a paper coming out sometime this year, I hope, that, um, goes back and analyzes the, so the, the key assumption of the Uniquack equation in terms of these segmental activity coefficients and the rigorous uh, quasi-chemical theory. And so in this context, you can kind of get a better idea of why these two things are different. And, and so there are some similarities, uh, but when you throw in these weighting factors, um, that, that if those things are different from one, then you can see how you're going to end up with big differences. And this may be a way, an alternative way, of kind of fixing up patching uh, Uniquack in a way that makes it a little more accurate uh, relative to quasi-chemical theory. All right, so uh, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I've, I've said a lot of things about Uniquack, some disparaging comments, and uh, maybe you think that uh, you shouldn't be using Uniquack. Well, on the other hand, um, I, I showed you results last uh, fall where Uniquack comes out not too bad. 
And, and so uh, why is that? Should you be using it? I think you should. At this moment, it's, it's the best, okay? Or arguably close enough. Uh, if you're looking at low pressure VLE data, um, and, and why is that? Because two parameters is better than one parameter. <laughs> it's not a big surprise. There's two parameters that are adjustable in these top three models, and only one parameter that's adjustable in these bottom three models. And, and so you get smaller deviations, and, and that's not a huge surprise. It's a little interesting that the advantage goes away as we go up to higher pressures. And when we go to predictive models, um, you got to realize that the UNIFAC has maybe not exactly 100, but something on that order, parameters in it that have been regressed relative to the experimental data. And seeing this number makes me think that the overlap between this database and the database that Dortmund used must be pretty good because they've got really good tuned parameters to represent all of the systems that we had in this database. And, and so uh, as you move on to other types of UNIFAC, uh, it's not as great. Um, but when you move to Cosmo RS, I'm, I'm like saying, oh, Cosmo RS, pretty interesting, quasi-chemical theory. Yeah, it's not even close to, to UNIFAC. Yeah, but you've only got seven parameters in Cosmo RS. And, and so What's the solution? How can we uh, compete with the older theories using the newer theories? I, I think there's, there's only one way to compete, and that is you, you've got to add on something that recognizes there are things that we don't know yet. And, and so we have this uh, je ne sais quoi contribution that we, we could add to the ESD mixing rule or some sort of Gibbs excess of je ne sais quoi, and, and that would be a way to deal with it. And, and this would give us the ability to go from predictive mode to uh, correlative mode with molecular scale instead of segment scale uh, interaction parameters for this je ne sais quoi contribution. And, and so uh, that's where I want to leave it. And uh, thanks for your attention. And um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Elliot. Uh, we are now open to questions. If you want to ask one, please enable your microphone or write it down in the chat so we can read it. Our YouTube viewers can write it down also, of course. I have a comment on, uh, uh, thank you Elliot for this overview about these models. Uh, uh, the original uh, uh, development of Uniquark, uh, well, Franz told me about this. Uh, they were thinking uh, they de derived uh, kind of generalization of quasi chemical theory. Uh, so the first paper, they talk about quasi chemical theory, but uh, if you see his book, they 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 don't talk anymore about quasi chemical. It's kind of two fluid theory because uh, they realize that uh, it is it's not it's far from quasi chemical theory. So it's not kind of linearization of quasi chemical theory. It's, 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 it's completely different uh, perspective at the beginning. Uh, they suggest a is uh, uh, two fluids that are independent of each other. So the contact uh, is wrong. The, the overall contact is wrong. OK, so um, right, but they still kept the name. <laughs> And no, the so name is, is the first version. The first version, uh, uh, they thought that th there is a way to, to solve uh, uh, quasi chemical theory without any kind of, uh, uh, what kind of linearization or, or simplification. But after that, they realized that it's, true, it's wrong. The, 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 the idea, uh, the, the you cannot explain uh, 
uniquark from the quasi kernel theory. Right. So I think what you're talking about is the Mar Krausnitz derivation. And um, if you look in the, you know, Elliot Lira book, you'll you'll see basically that derivation for square wolf spheres and mixtures of those. And and so uh, and and also I use a radial distribution function uh, argument too. And so, so it's uh, it's conceivable to write down all of these. Uh, contributions in terms of radial distribution functions and work out the local composition ratios and to think about what the assumptions are in those local composition ratios. And, and so that's sort of what I was alluding to in the slide where I talked about the ornstein zernike method. And, and so, yes, I, I'm aware that uh, later in 1978, Maurer and Prausnitz reformulated it and, and in that way. And I guess you could call that a two fluid theory. Uh, yeah. But they still kept the name. So remember, the, the title of the lecture is Understanding Activity Model. And, and so there are people, unlike you and me, who may not be familiar with all that history, like sophomores. <laughs> and so if they're reading you know, something that says it's universal quasi-chemical theory, and, and they go, oh, I guess it's it's related to quasi-chemical theory. I, I can understand yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, I know. Yeah, 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 it's true, it's true, it's true. Yeah, so I, I want to uh, try to clear up that confusion. The other uh, comment is, uh, uh, Warren Chapman, Warren Chapman just published uh, this year uh, a very interesting paper about uh, how to interpret a soft equation uh, using kind of uh, uh, liquid like uh, uh, active coefficient uh, equation. Uh, I think it's a very interesting paper uh, showing this relationship uh, and, and, and how you interpret. Uh, uh, but I think similar what, what you did, but you are more, more general uh, about several uh, approach. So I, I thought it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with audience. Walter's paper. Um, essentially, he, he's made some slight uh, generalizations in, in the sense that um, he does not need to assume that the volume of mixing is, or that the excess volume is zero. Okay, that's one of the slight differences uh, in his uh, presentation versus my presentation. Presentation. My presentation actually goes back to uh, Scatcherd and the definition of regular solutions. And as soon as you make that assumption and then you apply the Van der Waals equation to it, you, you get this result that I showed you with the Scatcherd Hildebrand. So that was shown by Hildebrand in 1949, I think. If I've got yeah, that's, that's very interesting. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we mentioned that in the text. I, I didn't have the citation for Hildebrand at the time, uh, uh, but I did derive the same result um, in, in uh, the yellow textbook. <laughs> it's there. Thank you. So can, does anyone I... want to? Yes, for sure. Can I have for sure. Hi, Richard. Thank Hi, you very Rafael. much for your presentation. Uh, my question is about your slide number three, uh, when you go back to Stubberman uh, Guggenheim, and um, and uh, you you were very quick. I would like to ask you to ex extend this a little bit because we also, in our models, also abandoned already this contribution and went back to the standard Flory Huggins uh, equation. And I didn't have time to see if the Flory Huggins DFH uh, curve goes very close to the simulation or, or what was that? If yeah, it's, could... it's even worse than the Guggenheim stabber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, should I explain more about what what I'm describing here? 
Uh, yeah, I, I would like to know if it is uh, worse or better. Uh, it, you already answered that, and so I'm um, I'm happy with that. Uh, but if we have time, uh, if the organizers uh, allows us, uh, I would like to hear a little bit more. Sure, sure. You can discuss. Okay, so um, you, I, I should mention that uh, this issue came up in the context of uh, the SpeedMD model. Um, you, 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 you've seen these pictures that I draw of a step potential, right? So mm -hmm. um, if you connect hard spheres by a bond length that's uh, 0.165, I think it is, uh, that's a carbon-carbon bond link, okay? And if you connect both the 1, 2, and the 2, 3 atoms on a, a propane, let's say, uh, by those 0.165s, and then you connect the 1 and the 3 by uh, 0.265, whatever it is to, take, to get a 110-degree bond angle, okay? Then you've essentially got an out, Right? with the right bond angle, and you can make that alkane as long as you want. And when we do the simulation to get the a thermal contribution, we ignore all of the steps, all of the attractive steps. We set those equal to zero. So there's no internal energy in the molecular model. But we can still do the simulation and calculate what's the, in fact, that's the standard simulation we do. We always strip that out when we do the simulation. And, and so we're calculating these pressures, these Z factors, uh, as a result of the simulation in every simulation that we do. And we can simulate mixtures just as easily as we can simulate, well, it's a little more complicated, but we can simulate mixtures in the same way. Like we simulate pure compounds and calculate these, these pressures. So there's a straightforward relationship between the pressure and the energy and when you realize that the internal energy is zero, then you realize that this Helmholtz energy that you get from this integration is actually the entropy. And so we just do the simulations over many different densities so we can do the integration. At each composition then, we have, I think it's 23 densities that we integrate to get what's the entropy at that exact composition. Using those entropies then, I can calculate what is this excess entropy that comes from the simulation? So it's tedious, <laughs> I must say, but it's very straightforward. There's no... And this, uh, um, and this entropy is temperature independent in this case. Exactly, it's an athermal entropy. Mm -hmm. Because there's, Great. It, it's just the repulsive part. Mm -hmm. And, and so now I, I can do that simulation over and over again this one was for octanol and water. This one was for hexadecane and ethane. And when I say octanol and water, it's you got to put that in quotation marks, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. using the exact structure of octanol, but it's it's really just without, a chain of water without here. any any interaction. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. no hydrogen bonding in it. There's nothing like that. It's just you know, it's a chain of hard spheres where the O has a little bit smaller diameter than the CH2 does. And, and so that's, that's, that's the nature of the molecular model. We did this uh, for long chains, short chains, branch chains, ring chains, everything that you can imagine in this paper. And the amazing thing was that it always followed this relatively simple quadratic mixing, Flory Huggins style quadratic mixing. So, so that's kind of good news. In the end, the fundamental behavior is quite familiar. We just need to figure out how to adjust the depth of this well. And, and so we come up with a generalized formula for how to do that. And, and so um, that's what the rest of the paper is about. And, and it works pretty well. Amazing. Thank you. I'll take a uh, better look on edit. Thanks Thank again. You. So does anyone want to ask another question? Well, okay, so 
Our time is almost over. I want to thank you everyone for the discussion. And once again, thank you, Professor Elliot, for the amazing presentation. Thank you.